Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's uh, Wednesday, December 27th, 2023. Uh, we're getting to the end of this year. We got a study today and tomorrow's. And we're still uh, spinning our wheels in Daniel chapter 11, verse 14, 15, and 16. But I think we're going to start being able to move ahead here. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the study time that we have together. We're thankful, Lord, for the things that you teach us. And we're thankful for the trials that we face and um, the way that you work in our lives, that you bring us closer to you and more dependent upon you each day. And we just ask that you can continue to do a work upon our hearts. Give us for our sins and help us to trust in you fully. Be with us in this study and help us to apply these things to our time is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, I, I keep apologizing for these studies. One is because we're moving so very slow, and it's just necessary. So one of the things that you can see by these studies is we examine everything, we take our time, and um, we want to understand uh, God's word because... <laughs> We need help. We, we need we need help from each other studying together. We need the Holy Spirit uh, to teach us. And we are in a very difficult time in Earth's history. And there's all kinds of voices out there, all kinds of people clamoring for attention. And even in, in this area of Daniel chapter 11, um, there are people who, you know, will write comments, sort of not understanding what's going on, having other suggestions. Everybody seems to have their own agenda. And, you know, the question is, why are we studying? Why, why should our study be any more important than anyone else's? And we don't think it is. There, there's nothing about us that makes us and what we're studying um, and how we're, what the conclusions that we're drawing as more important than anyone else's personal study. We may draw conclusions differently than some others. But it's important for everyone to study these things. So we can't, we can't understand things in a way that we don't understand them. That is what we are doing, the process that we are going through, we believe to be the correct process. That is, we need to seek God. We need to compare scripture with scripture. And we have a pattern of comparing line upon line. So history with history. And we know that we have gone through an experience in this movement based upon a very solid foundation, an application of the prophecies of the past and their parallel to the present. And so that's what we're doing. And so even if we're wrong about some things, we're not wrong about the process that we're, we're using. And so somebody may come and criticize some of our conclusions, but the question, the question that they need to ask is, are we doing things the right way? Is our approach correct? If our approach is correct, then there shouldn't really be a problem. They should be able to join in the studies, make suggestions, and follow along. Now, they could say our approach is wrong, but I'm not sure where they could point that out. Nobody's, nobody's done it yet. Nobody said, you have a completely wrong approach. They just don't agree with our conclusions. But I don't know what their approach is. So... I think we've made our method of study, how we're approaching this, very clear to everyone. Now, what we had decided quite a long time ago and what we looked at again yesterday, and and Dwight and I weren't really on the same page there. At least I don't understand how he was seeing things. And, and uh, once he gets to a, a better microphone and we can hear him more clearly, maybe we can sort that out. But to me, it's very clear that Rome uh, comes in at the end of Greece and that there is a time in which Greece no longer is part of Daniel chapter 11. When we start talking about the king of the north, it's not going to be the king of the north that's run by Greece. It's going to be the king of the north that's run by Rome. Rome is going to become the king of the north. It conquers that territory. 
and it also will conquer the king of the south. So it will conquer Egypt. So from that point on, we would start a new line. And so when we looked at this and we see, uh, you know, those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, right? That's going to be Egypt. And the robbers of that people shall exalt themselves. That's going to be Rome to establish the vision. But they shall fall sometime in the future. So the king of the north shall come, and that's going to be Syria. Cast up a mound, take the most fenced cities. And the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now, the way that this is often interpreted is that, it, it, and we're fairly close to that, there's a few things that we have that are different, but it will be the king of the north is Syria, right? He cast up, cast up a mount. It's going to take the most sense since fence cities. That's going to be Sidon, right? And, and this is going to be when they lose like the battle of Paneum, all the stuff connected with that. Now it says neither is chosen people. Some people will just see chosen people. That's Israel. But we can see that those are the people of his choice. Those are the elite. So even his chosen people. They're not going to have strength to withstand, right? And that's going to be the chosen people of the South, right? So the South, the arms of the South will, will not be able to stand and neither his chosen people. That is neither the elite. Now we had looked at the symbols and applied them to our time. Uh, you know, so for instance, we have the arms of the South and, um, anybody remember what the arms of the South was? It was just simply you add them together, you get a number 7265, and it's going to be 19.89 years. So 7265 days is 19.89 years. That would point to 1989, uh, and then there's a remainder of four hour, four, four point two six hours. So we have that symbol of, uh, 264, right? So that, April 26th date, that symbol that comes from Josiah Lich's prophecy. So it ties it to our history. Now, we know that when we're, we're addressing this, we're addressing this as the end of Greece. So there was all kinds of symbols that would uh, show that this is, is related to events dealing with the civil war between the Democrats and the Republicans in our history, but that they serve as symbols also for the beginning of our line. And that is uh, when the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. Uh, we have two applications of it. We have an application that occurs prior to November 9th, 1989. And then we have an application that would apply to the Sunday law. And so in this history, we saw all kinds of symbols uh, related to the Sunday law, especially when you get to verse 16, but him that cometh against him, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed. So we could relate that to Daniel 11 verse 40. And, and that's going to relate to the beginning of our time as well as the end of our time, because there is, you know, it's going to be the time of the end, 1989 to the Sunday law. So, so we can see that the Sunday law part of it, for Greece is there, but it also parallels the Sunday law, you know, at the end of the world, right? So hopefully that's clear how I'm expressing that. So, so we can say that Greece ends once Rome is there completely. And that is going to be Daniel 11 verse 16. That's where we're going to end Greece. I mean, Rome has already come in. You could say technically verse 15 is the end of Syria, but it's not really going to be the end until Rome comes in and conquers Syria. So that's, that's going to be Daniel 11 verse 16. When we, when we look at this verse in Daniel and Revelation, it says Rome conquers Syria and Palestine. That's what Daniel 11 verse 16 is. And now there is a number of, of, of things in here. Um, although Egypt had not been able to stand before Antiochus Magnus, the king of the north, Antiochus Asiaticus could not stand before the Romans who came against him. No kingdoms could resist that this rising power. Syria was conquered and added to the Roman Empire. When Pompey in 65 BC deprived Antiochus Asiaticus of his possessions and reduced Syria to a Roman province. 
So this is going to be quite a bit later that, that, that this happens, but that's what the history is showing. It's not going to show us all the details of this history. It's just going to show us some of it. Uh, the same power was also to stand in the Holy Land. So this is the glorious land and consume it. The Romans became connected with the people of God, the Jews, by an alliance in 161 BC. From this date, uh, Rome held a prominent place in the prophetic calendar. It did not, however, acquire jurisdiction over Judea by actual contest until 63 BC. Now they're going to deal with this alliance. Now we know the alliance is the official, you know, the date they enter into an alliance, I guess, is 161, but it's going to be 158 BC where the, the conditions of that alliance then are placed. So they make a league, but the league really comes into effect in 158 BC. On uh, Pompey's return from his ex- expedition against Mithridates, Eupater, king of Pontus, two competitors, sons of the high priest of the Jews in Palestine, Arcanus and Aristobulus, were struggling for the crown of Judea. The cause came before Pompey, who soon perceived the injustice of the claims of Aristobulus, but he wished to defer decision in the matter until after a long-desired expedition into Arabia. He promised then to return to settle their affairs, as should seem just and proper. Aristobulus, fathoming Pompey's real sentiments, hastened back to Judea, armed his subjects, and prepared for a vigorous defense, determined at all hazards to keep the crown, which he foresaw would be adjudicated to another. After his Arabian campaign against King Aretas, Pompey learned of these warlike preparations and marched on Judea. As he approached Jerusalem, Aristobulus, beginning to repent of his course, came out to meet Pompey and endeavored to arrange matters by promising entire submission and large sums of money. Accepting this honor, Pompey sent Gabinius at the head of a detachment of soldiers to receive the money. But when that lieutenant arrived at Jerusalem, he found the gate shut against him and was told from the top of the walls that the city city would not stand by the agreement. Right. So there's going to be this this whole history dealing with um, what happens. Uh, so the partisans of Aristobulus were. Uh, def- um, where is it here? Just jumped. We're defending the city, who those of Hyrcanus for opening the gates. The latter, however, being in the majority prevailed and Pompey was given free entrance into the city, whereupon the adherents of Aristobulus retired to the temple fortress. Now, I don't know how much of this history is is really important in this part, except that we can see that uh, this is Rome in this in this history. So for the first time, Jerusalem was, con- by, was by conquest placed into the hands of Rome, that power which would hold the glorious land into its iron grasp till it utterly consumed it. So what happens in 63 BC is, is pretty important. Uh, no, no, knowing all the details of that history, I don't know how much we need to know. We just need to know that that's going to be Pompey in 63 BC. And that's when Jerusalem is now, the city of Jerusalem is under the control of the Roman empire. Now, what we, we can see then is that Rome arises And so if we're going to put 63 BC on our lines, where, where would we put it? So as a parallel in the present truth application, what, what is the symbol there that we would look for? Because we have a symbol there that's describing what happens in this siege in 63 BC. And what is that symbol? The fact that it's one half of 126. Okay. Um, so you're saying the 63 being uh, a symbol of, okay, so that's an interesting point, which I wasn't thinking of. So 63 is half of 126. I, I'm just thinking about the siege itself, but let's just take a look at this idea. Now, we do have 63s in our line. Now, we know that 63 is also one quarter of 252, right? So so we have that that symbol of 63. I mean, 63 is also a symbol of the sixth day of the third month, which is Pentecost as well. But the symbol that I usually think of in connection with the siege is the 10th day of the 10th month. So we had in our lines shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. Um, we added these together 
5975-5375 and 2377 to get 13727. And that went from June 7th, 1982 to January 6th, 2020, which is the 10th day of the 10th month. Now we have the 10th day of the 10th month marked in our lines in various places. We have lots of dates that align with the 10th day of the 10th month, significant dates uh, that we have used. I'm just going to go here so we can see some of them as I can. The 10th day of the 10th month originally is the siege on uh, January 5th, 587 BC. It's the 10th day of the 10th month of the ninth year of um, Zedekiah, right? Um, so that's where we get the symbol, the 10th day of the 10th month. So it's going to all be connected to that destruction of Jerusalem. So I get past all of these. Like January 1st, 1844, for instance, is the 10th day of the 10th month, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think that one's correct. On January 1st, 1863, remember when we were looking at the Civil War, the American Civil War, that's going to be uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Right, so there you have, in a sense, it's a siege of the Republicans against the Democrats in that civil war. We call it a type of siege. Uh, I know we have a lot more in our personal lines, uh, like our, our lines of FFA. Let's see here. So, this is still dealing with the civil war, still dealing with that history. There's ones that are more recent. I'm going to get to those. Um, so obviously December 25th, 2020. So remember we had December 25th, 2021 is the 20th day of the ninth month. But in 2020, we're going to have the bombing of Nashville. And that's going to be the 10th day of the 10th month as well. Right? So it says that's the last match. That's slide number 391. So we're going to have that 10th day of the 10th month show up in our history. And so now we know that um, uh, we also have this January 6th, 2020 as also being uh, the 10th day of the 10th month. So that's that number there where we add up, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. And that's going to go from, and, and what this do is this is doing is it's connecting uh, this history of the exalting themselves to establish the vision in 1982. This is uh, the first meeting of Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan. So it'd be a very significant meeting, and um, it's going to go to one year prior to the January 6, 2021 date. So January 6, 2021, uh, you're going to have, of course, the actual siege of Washington, D.C. So this is prefiguring it. Now, why, would, why wouldn't this number just go right to January 6, 2021? I mean, from a symbol point of view. Why is it going to go to the 10th day of the 10th month in 2020 and not to uh, the 22nd day of the 10th month in 2021, which is January 6th? So on the biblical calendar, that's the 22nd day of the 10th month. So why does it go to the 10th day of the 10th month here, January 6th, which as far as I know, nothing of significance happens, but it's going to be one year. So what would be the reason that God has given us this symbol that appears to fall one year short of the actual siege of Washington. So what would the reason be? I'm asking you to try to reason out what God is trying to do, but there would be symbolic reasons for this. So what would they be? All right. We've got this 10th day of the 10th month where we're showing, of course, the number 10 being a number of judgment, right? Okay. I, I don't, you, you keep saying 10 is a number of judgment. All right. I've, I've never understood that because it's a number of of the world. Every time I see ten, it represents the world. So where where would you have it as a number of judgment? Just because the tenth day of the seventh month? Where is the world in sin? Yes, but it represents the nations of the world opposed to God. Right. Well, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be like we? It's finally going to be judged. Yeah. Yeah, they will be, but I'm just saying the number, if I look at the number 10, it just represents the world. That's how I would represent it. Yeah, you could say they're going to be judged. I just don't, I'm asking Dwight why he says it's a number of judgment. Is it because that's, it's the 10th of the second month? That's the way I've always looked at it. I mean, when when we get that 
especially from the tenth day of the seventh month of the seventh month. Okay. There's okay. there just seems to be other other points. I mean, I'm trying to put this out so that we can have a discussion about this. Yeah. Now, as you're looking at this with January sixth, twenty twenty one being the 22nd day of the 10th month Mm -hmm. on the biblical calendar. Yeah. On the, on the biblical calendar. If we were looking at that and multiplying those two figures, of course we come up with 220. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even 22 by itself is a symbol of restoration. Right. Okay. But yeah, so 10 is usually attached to something else. When it's attached to the 10th day of the seventh month, it's judgment. When it's attached to the 10th day of the 10th month, it's the siege. Uh, Attached to the fifth month, it's going to be relate to the destruction of the temple. Okay, now, okay, but on those, on that situation, as you just pointed out, Mm -hmm. 10th day of the 10th month being the siege, Mm -hmm. wasn't the siege also a type of judgment? Yeah, well, it, it is a type of judgment, yes. Okay. So, so, but but the thing is, this is the siege, right? That's that my point. Is you can say it's a type of judgment, but it's a specific type of judgment. It's a siege. It's not any other type of judgment. Does that make sense? You also got you also got the um, the Israelites when they um, when they um, tempted God. And had to go into the wilderness for 20 years, 40 years, excuse me. Yeah, 40 years. So the question is then, why is this going to be one year short? Because it would be a been, would have been really nice if it just went to January 6, 2021, right? You know, we would have said, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing. But, but it didn't. It goes to January 6, 2020. This, this, um, number 13727. But it's going to go from June 7th, 1982. So, right. So this is Rome exalting itself to establish the vision in connection with Reagan. Now, we know Rome also comes in connection with uh, Jimmy Carter. Right. We also looked at dates dealing with when they get a first ambassador. Right? So we put all those dates in in a document or not in a document, but in a um, uh, the calendar converter. And. There we have, I think this is the right one. Yeah, so these are the dates we put in yesterday. I don't know if I can remember them all, but I know that the first one, October 6th, 1979, that's going to be the meeting between Jimmy Carter and Pope John Paul II. So that's the first time Pope John Paul meets the president. We're going to have the start of the Soviet-Afghan War, December 24th, 1979. 621 1980, that's going to be George Bush meeting with Pope John Paul II. And then this is the June 6, 1982 date, right? So if we went from this date, I didn't have it in here, but if we just typed in uh, the 13727, it's going to bring me to January 6, 2020, the 10th day of the 10th month, you can see there. And then we have uh, January 10th, 1984. January 10th, 1984 was, uh, what was that? I think that would have to do with the ambassador or something like that. Just trying to see if we have this, not something else. Okay, so January 10th, 1984. I don't know what that date was. Anybody remember? Because it's definitely not a meeting, so I don't know why it's in there. Uh, May 5th, 1984 is going to be a meeting. So you're going to have, uh, or put it this way. Right. So, or, did I put May 5th? So it should be May 2nd. Well, it's May 2nd. Yeah. May 2nd, 1984. And then we have June 6th, 1987. That's the second meeting where, uh, they meet at the Vatican. The one on May 2nd, 1984 is going to be. You ask about. January 10th of 84? Yeah. That's the reestablishment of full diplomatic relations with the Vatican after 117 years. Okay. So 117, that's significant. That's a symbol of July 18, right? So okay. broke off diplom- diplomatic, why is it 117 years? 
when when did they break off diplomatic relations? 1867. Okay, so why did they do that in 1867? I remember that Lincoln had sent a couple of parties. They had not established any kind of a diplomatic relationship. I'm looking to see what the, the reason was. Okay, well, Lincoln's not there in 1867. No, but Johnson was. Yeah. Okay, so is there a specific date in 1867? Just a moment. Okay. And, and the thing I like about 1867 is it's a symbol of July 18th in that from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month is 186 cardinal days and 187 inclusive days. And so I sometimes just say, uh, you know, it's 186 or 187. So 186 slash seven. So it, it gives me that symbol. So in 1867, it'd be interesting to know what date. Okay, in 1867, it was 28th of February. Okay, I'm just going to get rid of this date here. Okay, so the 26th of February. 28th. Oh, 28th of February. So February 28th. Which was the 22nd day of the 11th month of the biblical year of 5911. And your Mayan long count, the first three digits are 12, 12, 12. That's interesting. Okay. So there, there, so what specifically, how do they describe what happens on that date? Well, from the time of George Washington, the United States have been maintaining a consular relationship with the papal states. Okay. Now, under Andrew Johnson, the Congress decided to pass legislation that prohibited any future funding of United States diplomatic mission to Rome. Okay. So there's 117 years. And specifically, uh, we would say it's 42,684 days. That's the number of days that there is no official diplomatic relations. Now, the reason that they did all this was because of a growing anti-Catholic sentiment over the assassination of Lincoln. Yeah. This was okay. done after Mary Surratt and had been convicted and hung. Okay. Okay, so so that's going to last until well, so that's going to be uh during the time of Reagan. So Reagan is going to formally establish these diplomatic relations. So we'll say that's 42684. And then we have the May 2nd date, 1984. Now, uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, too, was this verse. So let's, I'm going to go here. So this is uh, the Bible indexer. And you can see that you can take these verses and you can, you can see what they call the lexical sum, right? And each of these verses is going to have a number of that, that we can use as a span of time. Now, uh, this one span of time here, if I take verse 14, when Rome, the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision, uh, we used lots of numerical symbolism from the words in this verse. But if we just take all of them, it's six, seven, nine, seven, five. Now, usually what, what I do with this number is I go back to some point in the history of, of the time of the end. Because it's, it's going to be a period of about 180, uh, 187 years and 55 days, 186 years and 55 days. So that's how long that would be as a period of time. And let me see if I can do it here. Um, because I got all these different dates. So I got less dates in this one. So normally we have, uh, 1798. And we go to February 15th, right? So that's usually when we mark the time of the end. So you got the 16th birthday of um, William Miller, and you're going to have the Pope being taken captive. So if I count this number of days, it's going to bring me to March 27th, 1984. So it doesn't bring me to, you know, the January 10th date. It doesn't bring me to the June sixth a seventh date just brings me to some time in between that march twenty seventh nineteen eighty four okay 
is that significant that we can take that verse and it gives us this symbol? Or is this just, you know, one of those random coincidences that doesn't mean anything? I don't know how to answer your question. I'm looking at, at other situations right now. Okay. Because from the time that Franklin Delano Roosevelt sent a personal envoy to Rome. Yeah. To the time that Reagan reestablished diplomatic relationships. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that there had been a total of eight U.S. presidents, not including Roosevelt, that had visited Rome with their wives. Okay. So the other thing about it is that when they, when the presidents would visit Rome and have an audience with the Pope, their wives were required to wear a black head covering called a mantilla. Okay. I know that's a physical thing, but it's just odd in the way I'm looking at this. Okay. So the one thing, yeah, I don't know the significance of that. Of All course. I know is when we take uh, these dates, uh, January 10th, 84, to March 27th, 84, it's going to be uh, 77 days. So the March 27th, we don't have any event there, but we have connected to the time of the end. It's going to be 67,975 days from February 15th, 1798 to March 27th, uh, 1984. And that's 77 days after the, they, ha they have officially uh, regained diplomatic relations with the Vatican, the U.S. has. And then to the next time that the Pope and and Reagan meet, because they met uh, June 7th, 1982, they're going to meet on June 6th, 1984, and that's going to be 71 days. So it's, you know, it's have the symbol of 77, we have 71, whether that's a symbol, whether that can be just like 7117 or 1117. <clears throat> anyway, those symbols relating to that period of time, it can be 17. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that particularly. But March 27th, 1984 is a significant date. And so Rome is exalting itself in this history. And it's going to bring us to this history, which, which is a symbol of the Levites, March 27th. And it has the 77 days from when they officially have uh, uh, set up diplomatic relations once again. So so I would think the two symbols, the 77 and the March 27th, taken from the lexical number of Daniel 11, verse 14. I think we could say that that's, that has a couple of witnesses there. Would people agree with me there? You know, we probably could find more because we've not found so many. But the main thing that we're saying here, which I think is easy to establish, I don't think it requires a lot of thought, it, because we've already understood this, that Rome exalting itself to establish the vision in Daniel 11, verse 14, it has its parallel to our line, and we can connect it to 1798. That is, we can connect based on this verse 67,975 days we can we can attach that from the time of the end in 1798 to this history when Rome is once again exalting itself that makes sense that there, there shouldn't be a problem there do people agree so if we agree then we can say that verse 14 marks a beginning if we're going to start looking at rome we're going to put rome here exalting itself in the period of time that we would call the 1980s that period of time rome exalts itself to establish the vision in connected with our time of the end so then when it says the king of the north shall come and cast up a mountain take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand would we apply this then to November 9th, 1989, right? We've already made an application of it to our time presently, but can we then take, make an application of what happened in that time, in 1989? That's possible. Right? Okay. 
because this is what we understood in the past. So this isn't anything new. It's just now we're, we're trying to establish it again that, that that history from 79 to 89 is the history that is paralleled with Rome exalting itself in Daniel 11, verse 14. Or pardon me. Uh, well, yeah, verse 14. And now in verse 15, that's going to mark what happens when Reagan and the Pope combine together. So that's Daniel 11, uh, verse 40b, right? And then, of course, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will. So this is, again, we just look at that and we said, well, it ends Greece, but it also begins Rome. So this is the beginning of this history in which we're in, which is the history of the Sunday. But now it's going to give us more detail than we had in the past. <clears throat> the whole idea of Daniel chapter 11, going back and looking at these different histories, was to show that there was more to our history than we knew that we could get from Daniel chapter 11. That is, the civil wars represented these battles between the North and the South within the United States. Now, originally, when Jeff was making these applications, it had to do with Russia and the U.S. Uh, but we know that's not correct. We don't, we don't have Russia being the king of the South in this history. Right? Russia's no longer, it's, it's going to be a battle between ideologies. And that battle is between republicanism, we could call it that, apostate republicanism, and wokeism, atheistic communism, which Russia is not a communistic country. Might be a dictatorship, but it's definitely not communist and it's not atheistic. Right? It's corrupt. <laughs> you know, basically Russian gangs run Russia, but um, you can't call it a communistic country. It's not controlled. It's not a government controlled economy anymore. It's a type of free enterprise, but it's, it's not ruled by law and order. It's pretty corrupt. So can we agree with that, that idea? Okay. Nobody's going to be committal on that. Please repeat your question. Well, the question is, Jeff initially applied all of this information from Daniel chapter 11, that he was going to reapply these civil wars. He tried to see them as battles between Russia and the United States. Right? Okay. Russia was going to still be the king of the South. But we've come to recognize that that was a misapplication, that Russia is not the king of the South. Because that characteristic left the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union fell. And so all the details in Daniel chapter 11 were actually discussing or describing or paralleling what was going on between these two powers, apostate republicanism, we'll call it, and wokeism, right? So there's a battle going on, the Civil War, the way that we applied it to get more detail in our history about the kings of the North and the kings of the South had nothing to do with Russia, right? Russia doesn't have any part to play in this. Russia is not an atheistic, communistic country. I know people want to see Russia in there. Many people still want to see Russia. They've always wanted to see Russia. It's, it's the enemy, right? But, but so is apostate republicanism and apostate Protestantism. The world is our enemy. We're, we're just ambassadors. So anyway, when we, we look at this history, then we can agree then that the battle that we had with the civil wars were battles between two ideologies, not between the United States and Russia. So I, I think that we established that. So now when we look at this history, the king of the north coming up against the king of the south, this is November 9th, 1989. Now, when it talks about the arms of the South, right, so we had addressed that, we can make an application in our history that's going to connect us to January 6th, 2020. But that's in our immediate history. If we want to get this as the beginning of Rome, where would we place this? And, and, and so what we do is we have this connection, we have this thread, this number of days, Right. That number of days is going to tie us from um, a symbol in our time, January 6th, the 10th day of the 10th month, to a symbol in this time preceding November 9th, 1989. 
So the arms of the South shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength. And so we have the arms of the South, which is going to be Russia in this history, not the Democrats, right? If we're applying it to, that is, we can make a connection between what happened with the Soviet Union and what's happening in our time. I don't know how to make it any clearer. Hopefully people can see the connection. That that arms of the South ties us to a history prior to 1989. And it brings us all to, to our present time in the conflict between the Democrats and the Republicans. And it's going to give us a date one year before January 6th, 2021. It's going to give us January 6th, 2020 which is going to have the symbol of the 10th day of the 10th month, the siege. And so why is it giving us that symbol? Why doesn't it just bring us to January 6, 2021? Why does it bring us to January 6, 2020? I hope people can understand this question. There's a lot with what you're pointing out. At this point, when Elder Jeff was addressing that, the Soviet Union was not so much the representative of the King of the South as Russia had been. This appeared to be quite logical. Now, the way that we've been approaching this regarding wokeism and apostate Protestantism is a hard pill for others to swallow. So the question that we're going to have to address is going to be more that has the King of the South truly segued from the communists, just as it had segued from France. from France and before that from Egypt to being where we're at with this right now. Okay. So, so I think it's pretty clear, at least to us, that Russia is not the King of the South. And that that application was wrong. Now, to say it was logical, at that time, we didn't have enough information to draw another conclusion, though I didn't fully buy into it. But but that's just me. Right. So um, I had problems with it, but but I accepted it. So so even though I had problems with it, I, I thought there's some things that didn't make sense. I didn't have enough information to to draw another conclusion at that time. I hadn't really looked into wokeism. I hadn't really looked into, I, I wasn't up on what's happening in the world, to be honest. I mean, I've always been much more in the past. So my interest always was Bible prophecy, you know, since I've been in this movement, you know, looking at the prophetic periods, looking at the patterns and the structures of the prophetic periods. I wasn't even trying to apply them to our time. I was just trying to understand, you know, all of these different prophetic periods and seeing that they were all connected and we had all these symbols. But I wasn't I wasn't really interested in politics. I didn't I didn't, you know, read the newspaper. I didn't watch the news. So I didn't know what was going on in the world presently. And I generally just don't t- trust what I read on the Internet. I don't trust Facebook or YouTube. So I don't really watch those things or pay attention to. So anyway, at this time, when we start talking about Russia, what I do remember is Jeff bringing up this book, which had part of the cover cut off, something to do with uh, lies or something like that. But anyway, it's a book about uh, the plans of the, of Russia, but it's, it's, it, it um, basically gave up in that war, but it still had longer term plans of what it was going to do to come back to the United States. And that seemed reasonable. But the thing is, even if the people who at that time had these plans, you know, one of the problems that we have with long drawn out plans, like obviously the papacy is a little bit different. The papacy's interest is, is eternal, right? And why is that? Why is the papacy's perspective eternal? Why are its plans eternal? And we couldn't expect that from a nation. Why can the papacy make such long-term plans that cover hundreds of years, centuries? But you you wouldn't expect that of a government. Governments are short-sighted. Why is that? Because in many ways they can be overthrown. Okay. Well, we say Rome doesn't change. And you say, because that's in the comments by around there, 
And you say, well, they can't be overthrown or they can be overthrown. Governments can be overthrown. Yeah. So governments, they don't have an eternal perspective because they're not a religion, right? That is, they don't believe in eternity. Rome does believe that they have this destiny to be the rulers of the world, that at some point in time, the whole world is going to worship Rome, right? That Christ's kingdom is going to be fulfilled on earth, right? That's what Rome believes, and that's its its role, its destiny, its purpose. And so the individual's personal prosperity is tied up in that, right? So, you know, you could become a saint or something like that. With with a nation, you can't have that. That person themselves, all they can hope for is gain in the present. But when they die, that's going to be it. So a government like the Soviet Union, because they don't have an eternal perspective, there's no way that you could expect the leaders themselves are going to care about what's going to happen after they're gone. I mean, they could say, well, you know, they'll make statues of me, but I'm not going to really be able to enjoy them. So other than just a person's personal ego, there isn't really anything to tie them to these long-term plans. So the idea that the Soviet Union could yield to the United States, dismantle its government, so that in the future it could get back at the United States, isn't really logical. Now, it doesn't mean that People might not have thought that. Uh, they might not know how long that would be. But you're looking at something that, that definitely has transcended their, their life, right? Those people are dead. So they would never see that anyway. And to give for a man to give up his temporal prosperity and probably even his life uh, for something that he would never benefit from, especially somebody who might be like a psychopath, you know, that's not really very logical, right? So, so even though Jeff presented this idea and it, and it could be true that people thought that way, I don't think they would have thought, you know, 40 years down the road, uh, we're going to then conquer the United States. You know, that I don't think they would believe in their ideology enough to care about something that's going to happen long after they're dead. So, so there was a lot made uh, by Tess about Putin and, you know, his connection with the KGB and all this kind of stuff. A lot of it's just nonsense, right? I mean, obviously he's connected with the KGB. But as far as his goals, his goals are personal. He has personal goals. He likes to be in charge of things. He, he definitely is not an, an ideologue for atheistic communism. He's not part of the left. He, he's more what you would call conservative. You know, in that sort of broad brush that we use. Okay, yeah, it's so, interesting to consider that that he is a conservative communist. Yeah. Well, he's not a communist. Just, Russia is not communist. They don't have a state-run economy. Now they are a type of dictatorship, but you can't call them communist. They're definitely not socialist. Even they're 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 basically run by gangs, which who are capitalists. Uh, they do use some, it might be a type of crony capitalism, but definitely you can't call them communists. Do people agree with me on that or do people disagree? You know, they're not atheistic. You know, they believe in the Russian Orthodox Church. That's the official church of, of Russia. I, I would have to say that I'm not in, I'm not in total agreement with what you're saying, but that's just an opinion. Okay. Yeah, I understand there's lots of propaganda about Russia that has has persisted and, and my view is that it's it's just propaganda you know if you look at what russia stands for it's opposed to homosexuality and transgenderism and all things woke and since wokeism is itself just another word for atheistic communism i don't see how you could argue that that russia is is woke or atheistic communist a country it just doesn't doesn't manifest itself in that way you know they, I, I do know quite a bit about russia especially you know before the russian revolution um about the culture and the society 
um, and how it operated and how it operates today is is basically it's just a corrupt, you know, they're just gangs, right? That's who runs it. Men don't live very long in Russia when as they drink themselves to death. And there's just all kinds of corruption. So people who have tried to do missionary work in Russia have found it's very, very difficult. So there's, there's different countries. For instance, I, I think it was in Russia, you know, if you donate money to a church, that money is going to disappear and not be used what it's meant for. There are other countries like Albania and Bulgaria, which, you know, were part of the Soviet Union, where if you if you give somebody money, it will be used what you specify it for. And if and if it's not used, they're not going to use it at all. They're not going to use it for something else, some equally good cause. If you give them money for a specific thing, if they can't get that specific thing, they hold on to the money. Right. Because I know I have a friend who's done all, all kinds of missionary work in these different countries. And he doesn't like doing missionary work in Russia because even the churches are corrupt. Even the Adventist churches, even the underground Adventist churches, they're all corrupt. It's just part of their culture. Right. Some other countries have a different culture. Anyway, the, the point that we're making here is that what we see in the Soviet Union definitely isn't atheist communism, but it is corruption. And Russia was a bad place before the Russian Revolution. And it was a bad place all through the time it was the Soviet Union. And and after the Soviet Union fell, it was still a bad place. It was still a place that was corrupt. And so it still continued that way. So that part is, hasn't changed. But the ideology that's operating the government has. So we're going to say that this arms of the South ties us to back to this time when Reagan and the Pope meet. Right? It's going to tie us back to uh, June 7th. Let me see here. So where did we get to? Um, yeah, so it's going to be June 7th, 82. It's going to bring us to January 6th, 2020. And that's a symbol. So again, I'm asking the question, why does it just bring us to January 6th, 2020 and not January 6th, 2021? Because the arms of the South are... In this history, it's going to be the military power of the Soviet Union. In our time, uh, the arms of the South are going to be the Democrats, right? So if it brings us to January 6, 2020, a symbol of the siege, is this not the warning of the coming of the siege that's going to happen? And we call that raffia. January 6, 2021 is raffia. So January 6, 2020 is a warning of the coming siege a year later. Does that seem fair? It, it symbolizes that history, and, it, and it's going to be, you know, in that, in that history 2020, you're still in the history of Trump, but we're going to say that in this history, the arms in this siege, it's going to be the fall of republicanism. The United States is going to become in control of or, or the Democrats are going to become in control. The globalists are going to become in control of the United States. So, so the power that loses is going to be the Republicans. They're going to have a siege of Washington, but they're going to lose. Trump is, that's really where Trump loses is in January 6, 2021. Obviously he loses in the election, but at that point, this so-called, you know, insurrection, which I really don't, you know, buy into that, that, that narrative that is in the media that Trump, you know, incited an insurrection. Now was Trump wanting to have a protest and hoping that that protest could have some effect? Yes. Was he wanting people to go in and, and, and take over the Capitol and appoint him king? I doubt it. You know, that's just too preposterous and it would go against what Trump would believe. So. Even if he believed what happened was unjust, there is a process to go through. And, and protesting is one of them. Peaceful protest, as he said. So to say that somebody who asked for a peaceful protest is actually inciting violence makes no sense. But be that as it may, what ends up happening is that Trump loses one year after that date. So, so we have a symbol of a siege. It's prefiguring something. 
So, so we can accept that there is, there is a relevance there in this span of time about the arms of the South. But here in this one, the arms of the South, it says they shall not withstand. But in this case, the arms of the South are going to actually defeat. They will be able to withstand, right? What happens on January 6, 2021. So we have sort of a mirror or a reverse of things, because if we look at June 7th, 1982, and then we count this 13,727 days, and we come to January 6, 2020, so we can say we're starting at a time in which the Pope and Reagan are going to be seeking to overthrow the Soviet Union. But now we're brought to this other history in which the Soviet Union the Democrats, atheistic communism is going to withstand, right? So, so we have, so we have an application to our time that we can apply, that we have applied to the Democrats, Republicans and all that. But the main application that we're making here when we're addressing Rome is that history in the 1980s, right? So even though we have that symbol, it ties us to the 1980s. So this is when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. So, so we're going to have to, with this uh, Daniel 11 uh, document that we've been working on, so we know that we have, uh, you know, we've done this. This is our present truth application, we call it, of the end of Greece. But now, and we still kind of have to finish some of this off, but we're going to come back to that. But now we're going to go through these verses again, right? So... When we go through these verses again, and it talks here in verse 15, uh, the arms of the south, you know, this in this symbol here, we're going to go here, the arms of the south. That's the one that gives us 1989. So which is the one that, oh, it's this one here. Uh, Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, pardon me. So I was getting mixed up. So this is the one from uh, June 7th, 1982. The arms of the south is going to bring us to 1989. Is that that one seven two six five? Sorry. So this one here, this is going to be the one thirteen seven two seven that's going to bring us to this history. So if I'm going to go here and make an application to our time, um, this this footnote probably stands. So let me go back. So I was getting mixed up here, and we have this other one in those times which we still have to address. Uh, the many, the Seven two two seven. What did I do there? Okay, that's going to be here. April fifth, twenty thirty to June twenty second, twenty ten. Backwards. Okay, um, so I have to figure this out. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to change this year. So this it says in those times during the fifth Syrian war. Now we're going to change this. So. So this is going to be this period. Obviously, all of these, this has to change, right? So how are we going to do that? How are we going to take this, these symbols, the 1992 and the H6256? How are we going to apply this to this history of where Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision? So here we have the king of the north. In those times, that number... Remember what we did with this, 1192 plus 6256. It ended up being 8248. So it tied us from, uh, how did it do that? So we have to somehow apply this symbol, 8248, to that history prior to. So it's, it's a symbol of 22 years and 212 and a half days. So what would we do with that? Okay, so is there anything that we can do with that? Okay, any any thoughts? How could we take, and in those times, where would we place this history? Would we look to place that after January 6th of 2021? Okay, well, we're trying to start with the beginning. So we're making an application to to this history preceding November 9th, 1989. So I would say that this fifth Syrian war would be this Soviet Afghan war. So the Soviet Afghan war begins December 24th, 1979, and it's going to end 
3,300. Let me see here. I don't even have that in here. For some reason, I don't. It's going to end in 1989, so I'm going to have to put it in here. Um, so it's going to end February 15th, February 15th, 1989. Oh, there it is. And February 15th, 1989. So it's going to last for a period of 3,341 days. Okay. So the Soviet Afghan war, how are we going to address this? I know our time is running out, but okay. So the number 3341 is 13 times 257. 257 is the 55th prime. So that's the number of days. So it's going to be 13 times 257, 3341. So I know this could be a little bit obscure trying to address, trying to address these different um, symbols. So I think there is something here that we, we, we haven't seen yet. Okay. Here's a simple, simple solution. So I'm going to say that this is the Soviet Afghan war, which is uh, 3,341 days. Now we haven't tied it to any of these numbers yet. So I think we can, but. So we have to figure out what, what that means, the number of days. We can, we can look at the dates that have symbols, obviously December 24th and February 15th. Okay. And then we have a there shall many. Uh, so the number many, the thing is it does give us a span of time, a June 22nd, 2010 to April 5th, 2030. But it probably has other significance. We haven't applied it here. It's 19.78 years. Okay. <clears throat> so any final thoughts here? I know it's um, it's going to take a little bit to sort through this, but I think that we just have to establish this based upon these symbols, that we can place this in this time. So we're going to have to look at these symbols in a fresh way. Okay. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today, and we just ask that your Holy Spirit can be with us throughout this day. Help us to follow and serve you. Bless each person studying. May you continue to lead and guide and help us in the study tomorrow to, to pull some of these things together from this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.